A couple of weeks ago, I was able to give a lecture for EM Sono Mastery. It was an online course in Italy. Thank you so much, Marco Garone, for letting me be involved. I would love to have been there in person, but, you know, virtually works great as well. In this course, I talk about my top four blocks. Now, this isn't a comprehensive lecture at all, but it's just to talk to you about the four that I like to do most frequently. Check it out and let me know what you think. If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs. Let us know how you feel about it. Yeah, we can definitely do that, or we could be better clinicians and use our ultrasound. My talk today is entitled Anestesia Loco Regional, Regionale, Cuatro Blocchi per il Pronto Socorso. Now, I... I do uh, have a little bit of, I actually like love Italy. I lived there for a couple of years. Um, that's why I say my Italian's rusty. I'm 36 now. I lived there when I was 16. So it's it's been quite a while. I get to practice every once in a while, but it's not as great as I wanted. This is my house. I lived in Naples. Um, this is my church where I was there. Here's me as a, a wee little 16 year old right there. Here's me goofing off in Rome with my uh, cousin and my brother. Here's more Rome. It's my grandpa, my mom. Of course, the Venice pick, you got to get one of those. Uh, this was a uh, Caserta, which was amazing. Um, little Capri action, which was also super fun. There's young me right there. And here's me just, I don't know, just chilling, being a teenager. Um, now, I did want to spend more time talking about how much I love Italy and how it's like my favorite country, but we're already running late, so I'm just going to go on with the presentation. The probe of choice for this is going to be your linear transducer for the vast majority of your blocks. Equipment, this is going to be your basic setup right here. You're going to want a, a syringe to put the anesthetic in, a draw needle to draw your anesthetic. Here's your lidocaine. I use a sterile uh, kind of, it, we call it a tegaderm. Uh, it's like a sterile sticker that you can put over the transducer to keep the uh, area clean. You can also use a sterile transducer if you'd like, like the ones that you use for central lines. Lately, I've been using a lot more sterile transducers because I've been doing a lot more central and large volume blocks. So you can totally just use a sterile tegaderm or you can use a full on sterile transducer sheath cover that covers the cord and everything. And then you need something uh, to clean the skin. Now, as far as the needle, you can use this really small needle. This is a 25 gauge, one and a half inch needle. And in the past, I've used that a lot. You have other options though. You can use an 18 gauge blunt tip needle. The 18 gauges, these are bigger, so they're easier to see on ultrasound. You can also use a spinal needle. That's what we have over here like for lumbar punctures. And then over here, this is what I've actually been using way more lately. And that is a dedicated nerve block needle. The reason that these are great is because the they're not very sharp. They're not cutting needles, which you want because Technically, if something's a little more sharp, you run into slightly more risk of actually harming the nerve itself, like cutting the nerve, or worse, actually getting some of the anesthetic inside the nerve bundle, which you never want to do. So that's why most people who do a lot of nerve blocks do it with these nerve block blunt tip needles. Additionally, they have this uh, extension tubing, which works really well because when you're holding the needle, you can actually, and this is with sterile gloves, you're holding the needle itself, you're, you have really good dexterity, and then you have a second person giving you the pushes of the lidocaine. So you can say, okay, give me a little squirt now, okay, stop, give me a little squirt now, okay, stop. So you just communicate with them. So it becomes a two-person technique. Now, identifying the nerves is something that once you know them, they're uh, not hard to identify. It's this thing right here, this little honeycomb shape. Sometimes they're circular, sometimes they're triangular. This is a blood vessel right here, and this is what they look like. Now, one thing that can be a little tricky is differentiating between nerves and tendons. They actually look pretty similar on ultrasound. This is, I'll tell you, one of these is the ulnar nerve, and one of these is the ulnar, uh, the flexor carpi ulnaris tendon. It's this one right here in pink is the tendon of the flexor carpi ulnaris of the wrist. And then in yellow is the nerve, the ulnar nerve. Now, one thing you can do to help tell the difference is uh, tendons will have this thing called anisotropy. Whereas if you just kind of bend 
the uh, the transducer kind of tilted a little bit. Fan it, I guess, is better. If you fan the transducer, the tendon will get darker, whereas the nerve should stay relatively about the same uh, consistency. It doesn't have anisotropy. That's a tendon thing. Knowing your anatomy also super important here. And then one thing, especially in the extremities, as you move further up, let's say you're doing an ulnar nerve block, as you move further up the arm, the nerve stays as a structure and in fact gets bigger, whereas the tendon will kind of turn into muscle. So here is um, a transducer looking at the ulnar nerve, which is right here. And then right here is going to be the tendon of the flexor carpi ulnaris. And you can see that the nerve stays as a structure. So right there, it's still that same honeycomb structure. Let's look at that again. This one's the nerve, and you see the tendon starts to kind of disappear into the muscle. That's a big way of telling the difference. Now, as far as your approach to these nerve blocks, you can do an in-plane technique and you can do an out-of-plane technique. Here's an example of an in-plane technique. This is a femoral nerve block or a fascia iliaca compartment block, which I'll talk about in a bit. But you can see that the needle and the transducer are in line with each other. That is how you differentiate between uh, short and long. This is a long axis technique. This right here is an ulnar nerve block. It's one of my favorite blocks. You can see really good visualization here of that needle tip. This is the nerve, and you can see that I'm getting that anesthetic all the way around this. And you can see why I like the long axis so much better. It's because you get just great view and you have really good control. With most of my life, it's just out of control. I have two dogs. I have three children. I'm uh, very ADD. But with nerve blocks, I want one, any procedure on ultrasound, I want 100% control. This is an out-of-plane technique. I usually do out-of-plane for median nerve blocks and for posterior tibial blocks, which this is what this is. And you can see that the transducer and the needle are out of plane with each other. Now, this is very similar technique to doing ultrasound guided IVs. You always have to make sure that you know exactly where the needle tip is located. Um, but it's another option here. And here is uh, more of a zoomed in version of this posterior tibial block. This is the posterior tibial artery. This is the nerve right here. And you'll be able to see my needle right there. That's my needle tip, this hyperechoic tip, putting the anesthetic all the way around that nerve right there. Now, as far as what to choose, as far as your anesthetic, you have a lot of different options here. You can use uh, very short acting, which is lidocaine 1% from uh, from my toolbox, all the way up to longer lasting, which is ropivacaine and bupivacaine. They all have a maximum dose, so just be really uh, aware of that maximum dose, and that's maximum dose over 24 hours. Most of the time, if I'm doing these blocks for procedures, so let's say I'm doing this for um, uh, glenohumeral dislocation reduction, I'm going to be using a shorter acting one. I typically go with the 1% lidocaine with epinephrine because honestly, I can put the most in there and it goes away fairly quickly if there's any complications from it. Whereas if you're doing something for, let's say, a femoral neck fracture, you're going to want to use something longer lasting like bupivacaine or more, more ideally ropivacaine. And that's got a lower uh, maximum amount that you can give. So just be aware of this. If you forget this or you haven't screenshot this yet, because I totally would have if this is the first time I saw this lecture, you can always go to highlandultrasound.com. This is a great website that has a bunch of nerve block stuff. The guys at... Uh, uh, over there in California at Highland, they do a great job with nerve block education. Uh, Arun Nagdev and uh, Andrew Herring are out there, among others, um, and they have some great stuff on their website. Definitely check it out. Now, before I talk to you about specific techniques and which ones I think are my top four, we got to talk about LAST or local anesthetic systemic toxicity. Now, this is a very rare but very important side effect of blocks that you have to be aware of. Now, what this is basically toxicity from your local anesthetic or toxicity from your lidocaine, from your ropivacaine. The side effects, you know, what happens with this when you have this toxicity is you can have cardiac arrest and you can also have like seizures and, and brain damage from this. It can even result in death. Now, now here's the good news. It's exceedingly rare. Most of the literature comes from catheters that had been placed 
not under ultrasound guidance, meaning they probably had these catheters embedded into arteries and were just pumping lidocaine into these patients' arteries and veins. It's much more rare when you're using a single shot. So if you're giving like you know 10 cc's, 20 cc's, 30 cc's, it's much more rare, but it has happened. It's I've not seen, to be honest, I've not seen any cases of local anesthetic systemic toxicity with emergency medicine providers, meaning people who are just doing it at the bedside. But be aware that this is a complication that can happen. Now with this, what this means is, is you gotta be careful, right? This is very rare. I've never even heard of it happening with peripheral low volume blocks. So if you're doing like a ulnar nerve block in the mid forearm, that is one that has so far has never been associated with last, right? The ones that have been associated with last are always more proximal, larger volume blocks. And for me, what this means is if you are performing a proximal or large volume block, so neck in the hip, a plane block in the trunk, any large volume, so we're talking greater than 10 cc's, all of those patients, when you're doing the procedure and at least 30 to 60 minutes afterwards, you need to make sure that they have IV access and they're on a cardiac monitor. Now, the IV access is in case you have to do stuff about it. It's not like you need IV access to perform the block. It's just in case you have that dreaded complication, you need to be able to give them the medication to fix it, right? And then cardiac monitor to be able to uh, be aware of those complications before they happen. The definitive treatment of last is IV fat emulsion or intralipids. There is a dosages right there. This might take a little bit of time to kick in. So in the meantime, if they have any neuro symptoms, you treat it with benzos. If they have cardiac symptoms like cardiac arrest, go ahead and treat it. The caveat to the cardiac arrest thing is that you want to give less epinephrine than you normally would. So they recommend, and this is based off of animal studies, they recommend giving uh, one-tenth of your normal epinephrine amount and then no beta blockers, no calcium channel blockers because um, in these animal studies, the animals did worse with those medications. All right, so that was the basic stuff now out of the way. Let's talk about my top blocks. These are my favorite blocks. Owner blocks interscaling, serratus, and the fascia iliaca block. They're my favorite slash the ones that I do the most because they're the most common indications. Let's start with probably a really good block to start with if you are maybe less familiar with these blocks. That is the owner block. It's very simple, it's easy, it's a low volume block, low chance for complication. Now, as far as the indications, it's basically anything on the owner aspect of the hand. Now we're talking deep and more superficial. On the left side of the screen, we have a laceration that worked, uh, that was sewed up very nicely with the uh, owner nerve block. It just took five cc's um, in the mid form to get that done. Um, in the middle here, we have a phalanx fracture. Over here, we have a we have we see this, this is probably the most common thing right here this uh, boxer's fracture so a fifth or fourth metacarpal fracture um if you need to reduce those which you, you don't always need to but if you need to reduce them uh the owner block does great and then over here we have a pinky dislocation a distal phalanx dislocation um, all of these are my cases that i've used owner blocks on and they've been helpful now, a quick review of anatomy. I showed you this uh, picture earlier. This right here is an ulnar artery. This right here is the ulnar nerve. And this right here is a tendon. So this is the flexor carpi ulnaris tendon. The ulnar nerve is always going to be right next to the ulnar artery at the wrist. And I usually start there to kind of locate it. Now, the reason why I don't like doing these blind, you, you can, you can just do them blind right at the wrist, right? You just feel the ulnar artery and then go medial or more onto the outside of uh, that artery. The problem is this, the ulnar nerve has some superficial, it's got some deep branches and they break off. So they, they separate out at variable distances from the wrist, right? So sometimes you might have that branch point be like right at the wrist. Sometimes you might have it all the way up here. And if you do it at the wrist, you might not be getting all of those little branches of the ulnar nerve. So you want to actually do it way more proximal in the mid forearm to make sure that you completely anesthetize that entire ulnar nerve. Additionally, right now, if you do it at the wrist with ultrasound, the artery is very close to the nerve. I mean, they're like touching walls, right? They're like kissing. 
And it's better to do it where the artery is not right next to the nerve. And as you move up the forearm, you'll see that it actually separates away from it. See how now the nerve is away from the artery? That is another reason why it's important to do it at the mid forearm rather than at the wrist. It's safer that way. So I'm going to show you an example of how to do it. Now, as far as positioning, it really just depends on where a specific patient's owner nerve is. Sometimes you can have them with their arm just kind of like laying out like this. But sometimes you're going to have to have them have their arm flex, kind of like in this position right here. I usually put a couple of pillows uh, or some towels, as you see here, to just make sure that their arm is supported. And you can see here that this is a, a fracture dislocation of that pinky here. And I'm going to come out here with my transducer. And you notice here, I'm mid form. Here is the ulnar nerve right here and there's nothing next to it. It's just meat between the, the needle, which is gonna come out over here, and this nerve over here. So it's a pretty safe block. There's really nothing else there. And so you can see my needle here in the long axis. Now, what I'm trying to do here is you see this hypoechoic fluid, it's getting underneath this nerve, which is good. I am a bit of a perfectionist with this kind of stuff, so I'm getting it below it, and then I'm bringing it back out, redirecting, and going above it as well to really create a nice circle right around that nerve. The next block that I want to talk about is the inner scaling block. Now, this is one that I really enjoy because it's, it's so helpful for patients. Probably the most common indication for this is going to be this, the glenohumeral dislocation or the shoulder dislocation, but it also works well for basically anything of the humerus. Here we have a, a pretty painful looking proximal humerus fracture and the interscaling block works really well for that as well. Now with this, the glenohumeral dislocation, which is you know the most common time that I'm going to be doing this, it's just so satisfying to do this block, right? It just, it just, I'll, I'll talk to you about it in a second. But before we got to talk about the alternatives, right? Whenever anybody has a fracture to relocate or a dislocation to relocate, most of the time we're going to go for procedural sedations. That's, that's, you know, sort of, you know, the standard of care, maybe, you know, to do a little propofol, a little ketamine or whatever else you use for this procedural sedation. But the nerve block is another option. And there's times where I'm doing the scan, I can't really see a good view of the interscaling groove where the brachial plexus is located, and I'll go to procedural sedation. So there, there are two options, but I will tell you that in most cases, the nerve block is going to be a little more advantageous, and I'll tell you why. And it's, it's about flow in the department. So this was a study that was done in the emergency department. They included 42 patients. They were randomized, 21 in the procedural sedation group and 21 in the nerve block group. And they were basically trying to see a bunch of different stuff as far as pain scores, length of stay, provider time. And they found in this group, it's a small patient sample, but it, but it, is, it kind of proves a point they found that the pain post-procedure was about the same. The oxygen saturation, desaturation, and hypotension, there was two uh, of each in the procedural sedation group and none in the interscaling group. There's not statistically significant. It was 0.5, so not statistically significant, but definitely had more than in the ultrasound group. But what's important here is look at the length of stay. The length of stay in the procedural sedation group was 77 minutes longer. So an hour and 10 minutes longer when you did the procedural sedation group. Also, the healthcare provider time was significantly higher. We have a five minute provider time with the interscaling block versus a 47 minute provider one-on-one -on -one time with a procedural sedation. So not only is your patient staying in the department longer with procedural sedation, but you are spending more time in the room with the patient with procedural sedation because you don't want them to stop breathing and die. It makes sense. So there are advantages and disadvantages to each, although I will say in the right patient, I'm usually doing the interscaling brachial plexus block. This is something that happens, right? This was a patient that was sent home, had a shoulder surgery, was sent home with a uh, interscaling brachial plexus catheter from anesthesia, from the surgery, was sent home, came back to the emergency department the next day with shortness of breath. On the left side here, you can see that I have really good movement. This is movement of the diaphragm. And on the right side, we have very minimal movement. This is the same patient taking the same big breaths. You can see here that the diaphragm is really not moving 
hardly at all on that right side, which is where he had the catheter versus the left side. And the reason for this is where, where you're doing the interscaling block, the phrenic nerve is right there. It is like right next to it um, whenever you're doing this. This is the classic kind of C5, 6, 7 um, area that or uh, brachial plexus bundle that we are aiming to block. The phrenic nerve is right there. For this reason, if I have a patient that has like a pneumothorax on the op opposite side, has any oxygen requirement, those patients that can't handle having essentially half of their breathing capacity taken away, I don't do this on them. So if they have a pneumothorax on the contralateral side, like I'm for sure not going to do this uh, this block on them because they won't be able to breathe. And if patients are on oxygen, they're, they're so kind of tenuous that if you take away half of their diaphragm, they're not going to do well. So there's caveats to the person to do this. The best person to do this in is in a healthy young person that has no other injuries other than that glenohumeral dislocation, nothing in the trunk. And most of the time, patients, even if they have their phrenic nerve partially paralyzed for a short period of time, they're not going to know. They're going to have no idea. The only way they'd know is if they tried to like run and they'd be like, oh, I'm more short of breath than I normally am when I run. Sitting down, they're not going to be symptomatic from it as long as they don't have any comorbidities in which they need that extra lung capacity. There's a couple of things that you can do to make this happen less. Uh, there was this study that used a pretty high concentration of ropivacaine, 0.5%. I usually use like 0.1 or 0.2. 0.5%, they went with 20 mLs versus 5 mLs. And they found that group one, these are 20 in each group, the amount of paresis was significantly less, nine out of 20 when they use the lower volume versus 20 out of 20 when they use the high volume. This one used a lower concentration. This is 0.2% versus 0.1%. And they found kind of similarly that they had eight out of 19 out of the lower concentration group had a hemidiaphragmatic paresis, whereas 16 out of 24 had it with a 0.2%. So more people had the paresis when they had a higher concentration. What this means to me is that when I'm doing this block, I'm not using rapivacaine, by the way. I am just going to be using lidocaine with epinephrine because it's short acting. And I'm using a small volume. I'm using five to eight cc's of 1% lidocaine with epinephrine. So it's a very lower concentration at a lower volume. And in my practice, I've so far have never had anybody. I've done, I don't know, maybe 100 or so of these. I've never had anybody tell me I'm short of breath not once. So for whatever reason, that's working. It might be the patient population I'm selecting to do this block in because I'm not doing it in everybody. But if you're going to be doing this, use a shorter acting and a lower volume anesthetic to try to avoid blocking their diaphragm. Now, when you're doing this, what you're aiming for over here is you're aiming for this interscaling block and you're aiming basically for the trunks and roots of that brachial plexus. Pro position here is going to be important. You're going to, you're going to want to place in the lateral neck. Have your patient rotate their head just a little bit off away from the side that you're going to inject. I would highly recommend actually coming from the back. So actually going through the trapezius muscle. And usually when you do it that way, your needle is going to come kind of on the ultrasound screen. You'll see it. It'll come straight across rather than at an angle this way. And when you come straight across the ultrasound is going to pick up that needle way better. So the ultrasound, the, the needle, the nerve block needle is going to be way brighter than it typically is if you came at this angle. It has to do with the way that sound waves reflect off of things. So you're aiming for this guy right here, the brachial plexus, and you're going to be basically getting these guys right here, right? All of these three things are what you're going to aim for. Here's what it looks like on ultrasound. This right here is the scalene. Uh, sorry, the uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle. This right here is the carotid and there's a little chunk of the uh, jugular vein. And what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to find the SCM and then rotate back until you find two other muscles that are kind of circly. This right here is the anterior scaling. This is the middle scaling. And right here is the inner scaling groove where the nerves are located. If you ever have a hard time finding them, what I do is I have the patient take a bunch of really deep breaths. 
When they take really deep breaths, they use their accessory muscles of respiration, which the inner scalene muscles will contract and expand when they're taking big breaths because they're kind of like accessory muscles. And you can see here that the middle scalene is moving, the anterior scalene is moving, and the inner scalene uh, groove where the brachial plexus in is kind of staying still. So you can more easily differentiate between those three things, middle scalene, uh, the brachial plexus, and the anterior scalene by having the patient take a big breath. So when I was an ultrasound fellow uh, at the University of Kentucky, I my uh, fellowship director, Matt Dawson, he was a bit crazy and I'm like a bit crazy as well. And one day I was just like, hey, like, I don't remember if it was me or if like he was the one that brought it up. But anyways, long story short, I had all of these blocks performed on myself. So here is my uh, fellowship director performing an interscaling block on me. Here's the back of my head. This right here is a transducer. He's coming in through my trapezius muscle. And you'll see that my brachial plexus is right about here. This is my anterior scalene. This is my middle scalene. And you can see the needle coming in. He's poking through the skin right here. There's that needle coming in and he's aiming for the area in between the middle scalene and the anterior scalene. That is the inner scalene groove where the brachial plexus is located. And you can see, I'll fast forward just a little bit. He's putting a little bit of fluid in there and you can see that it start to kind of separate the brachial plexus from the middle scalene. So that you want this fluid right in the inner scalene groove. Here is an example of one that I did, slightly better visualization. This is the brachial plexus up here. We got the anterior scaling over here and the middle scaling over here. You can see the needle tip right there, and you can see that the fluid is pushing the brachial plexus away from the middle scaling right in this groove. Now, if you think of the three kind of trunks of the brachial plexus is a stop sign, I usually aim for yellow light, like the middle one is where I aim and that's where I've had the most success. Although you can kind of go up here, eventually everything will kind of creep through um, and diffuse. You don't have to go to the other side. I don't do anterior approaches to the brachial plexus. I just do posterior. Um, eventually this anesthetic is gonna diffuse all the way across from posterior to anterior. All right, my next favorite block is going to be the serratus anterior block. Now this I've been doing a lot more of lately. The indications for this are going to be rib fractures, the most common indication. Here you see a bunch of rib fractures right here. These are very painful and you'll have patients that will refuse to take deep breaths, not because they're like, you know, being ornery and being mean. It's because it hurts to breathe. Um, you know, they, they need more oxygen, they can develop pneumonia and it's just painful. The serratus block works really well. The thing is though, with the serratus block, it doesn't work well with posterior fractures. It only works well with anterior and lateral fractures. So if you have posterior rib fractures, you have to do a different block called the, the um, erector spinae block, which I'm not gonna talk about here. But for anterior middle fractures works really well. And what I've been doing it honestly a lot lately is for these painful axillary abscesses, which are very difficult to anesthetize. I've been doing serratus blocks for these as well. It'll block basically the proximal medial arm. So it'll block this all the way to the kind of lateral aspect of the pectoralis and then all the way down. It'll get all of this. I actually was able to drain and pack this abscess without the patient even flinching. And before I did this block, she wouldn't even let me examine her because it hurt so bad. When I did the serratus block, pain completely disappeared. Now, as far as landmarks, this is called a serratus anterior plane block. So your landmarks are going to be the latissimus dorsi is going to be superficial. And then you're going to find the serratus anterior and you're injecting between the two. You're going to go at about the level of T4 through T6. So right around where the nipple is, is where you're going to like start it and then go laterally until you find that serratus. Right here is an example. See these things right here? Serratus muscle. So I'd place a transducer right here in between the lats and the serratus. For positioning of the patient, it's probably better to have them lay on their side because you'll be able to get a lot better um, ergonomics of it. Here's an example. I was, this was like in my basement with one of my residents. So like, I don't have gloves on, but if you're actually doing this, please put gloves on. I'd actually, if you're gonna be using this with a nerve block needle, which I would highly suggest, Put sterile gloves on so that you can actually touch the needle shaft as you're doing this, um, this procedure with somebody else pushing the anesthetic. Here is an example. This is courtesy of Andrew Herring of performing the block in real time. Now, 
you can't really see it, but the ultrasound machine is on the opposite side of the patient. So you have a good kind of line of vision to the ultrasound screen. So you can see really well what is going on. Very important to be using your nerve block needle for this because you really want to have really good um, dexterity and control over that needle because the complication of this is a pneumothorax. If you happen to go and aim wrong and poke the lung, you're going to collapse it. If you have really good finite movement of that needle, you're much less likely to lose control and to not have good visualization of it. So here is an example of performing a serratus anterior block. This right here is pleura, this bottom white line. This little bump right here is the rib. And this is very, very important. The trajectory of your needle, you want it to be headed towards the rib, okay? So notice here, if I happen to go a little bit too far or the patient jumps or, I don't know, something happens, an earthquake, you're going to poke the rib if you go too far rather than poking the pleura. So this is a really good backstop to have. This right here in red, this is the serratus muscle. It's basically a kind of linear muscle that's laying over top of the ribs. This muscle right here is the um, intercostal muscle. And then this is the uh, lats right here, the latissimus dorsi. I'm using a nerve block needle here. And you can see I'm injecting, I'm bringing the, uh, the needle to come in. There's a little test dose to see where I'm at. And then right here, I'm getting in the plane in between the serratus anterior and the latissimus dorsi. So I'm not quite there. You want to see when you're doing plane blocks, you want to see this, this kind of unzipping of it. The fact that the, the anesthetic is going along this fascial plane and kind of separating the two different muscle layers. That's how you know you're in a good spot for it. One other thing to keep in mind is there is an artery that you have to be careful for. This right here is one that I did recently for an axillary abscess. And you guys can see, see right here, there's a little circle-y thing. This is an artery. I, th I think it's a thoracodorsal artery. I have to remember exactly what it's named, but it's an artery. And oftentimes it's going to be very close to where you're going to want to inject. So please be aware of that. I'm going to put some color flow on it right here to show you. One second. So right there, a little color flow. And you can see that there is arterial flow there. Please don't poke the artery or don't inject directly into the artery. Um, here is the patient right here. This is the little bit larger um, serratus anterior here. There's that little artery that I'm trying to avoid. I'm going to get this um, needle to be right in that fascial plane. Now, right here, if I'm going to come back here, and this is any plane block and really any nerve block because all of the nerves that you're going to be aiming for when you're doing nerve blocks, they're actually going to be in planes, like between muscles and inside fascia. So you actually want to get the anesthetic in the fascial plane. You're not aiming to get it inside the nerve. Like if you get it inside the nerve, it's actually very bad. You'd increase the hydrostatic pressure inside the nerve, which could cause ischemia of the nerve, which you don't want. So you're actually all blocks. They need to be plain blocks. At the very beginning here, you're going to see I'm doing these injections and it's almost like the anesthetic stays in a ball or it comes back up towards the path of the needle. See right there? It's like just a ball right here and it's actually going up towards where the needle is. That means I'm in a muscle belly. I'm not actually in a plane where, is, where I should be. I'm trying again right here. I'm going to try and poke through. Right there, I poke through and then I do a little injection. I'm still not getting a good plane. It's kind of backing up. So I'm going to try redirect. Sometimes I'll twist the needle a little bit to try and cut into the right spot. And here in just a bit, you'll see right there. So right here, I'm in the fascial plane. And now I'm basically like unzipping the latissimus dorsi from the serratus block here. And I'll kind of fast forward. You can see how it just like expands across in this area. And I'm being very careful to avoid that guy right there. Now, one thing that I that you can do is what I'm doing here is I'm trying to go deep to the serratus as well. They've done studies where they do go above the plane above the serratus and the plane below the serratus. And there really is no difference between the two. So most of the time, what I'll do is I'll actually just inject superficial to that serratus uh, muscle. And I have great analgesia that way. The last block that I want to talk about is the fascia iliaca block. This one is probably going to be the most common because of this. This is a... a 
intertroch fracture over here, intertrochanteric fracture of the femur. Here's a femoral neck fracture. This is very common. They estimate that around 300,000 patients are hospitalized per year for hip fractures. And I think that was a study in the UK also. So it's a very common uh, problem. And the issue here is, I don't know how many times you guys have had these uh, kind of frailty elderly fractures where they, they just, you know, from sitting to standing, they fall, they break their hip. Getting pain control on these patients can be very difficult because these patients are much more likely to have delirium just in general, just being in a place, they're more likely to have delirium. You give them morphine, they're much more likely to develop delirium from that morphine. Additionally, like you give some of these patients like four milligrams of morphine and they stop breathing, right? Because they don't have a whole lot of, they might not have a whole lot of fat. Their physiology is a little bit different. So you run into real risk. You can over sedate them or you can over medicate them. They're they're very bad and it's very hard to get them to that right plane. And that's why one of the situations ultrasound works well. All right. Um, I have a question. So the first question, thank you. It is, if I want my block to last, I choose a long lasting anesthetic, don't I? But is there a maximum number of time I can perform and then repeat a top block in that anatomical site? Thank you very much. Yes. So, First off, if you are, let's say for this block that I'm going to talk about in a little bit, let's say for the fascia the aqua block where these patients get admitted, at least they do where I work, they get admitted to the hospital. You definitely want a block that lasts. And so for these patients, I'm using ropivacaine. Ropivacaine is a longer acting anesthetic. With the plain blocks, which that's what the fascia the aqua block is, it's a plain block, you have to use a larger volume. So if you get to the point where you are running out of like, amount that you can use. Let's say that the maximum dose that you have is, um, I don't know, 200, 200 uh, milligrams of the, of the ropivacaine is the max you can use. That's just random number. Let's say that you have a block and you only want to give a hundred milligrams, but that hundred milligrams is in only like 15 cc's of volume. What you can do is you can mix that with 35 or 25 cc's of normal saline or sterile water because you want the volume to spread out over a plane. You're much more likely to get more of the little nerves that kind of are in the fascial plane with a larger volume. And you can do that larger volume if you mix it with a non anesthetic and you still stay under the um, maximum amount. And if you're in a situation, so for me, when I'm doing this block, the fascia liaca block, um, I'm doing this with ropivacaine and the ropivacaine can last like six to eight hours. And by that time, six to eight hours, they're usually out of my emergency department. So anesthesia can then place a catheter. If you're in a situation where you might have your patient over a long period of time where you're the only provider, just, uh, you know, uh, ration, ration that, uh, that local anesthetic. Um, so let's say that you have 200 milligrams you can give over the course of 24 hours give a hundred, you know, give 75 at one point, then six hours later, give the other 75 then six hours later, give the last 75. So it's kind of like a rationing thing you can do. Um, the next question I have, thank you for the questions, by the way, it makes me feel that I'm not just like speaking into the void. You know, someone's actually listening to me. Um, they say, thank you, uh, professor. How steep do you think the learning curve is of this procedure? Are the pros much higher than the cons compared to systemic analgesics? That's a great question. Where do I start? I actually have a separate lecture that's called gateway blocks, which are not my, you know, gate. I don't know if you have the same expression in, in Italy, but you know, there's gateway drugs, like it's, it's dumb, but whatever, but marijuana, some people consider that a gateway drug. So even though marijuana itself is not very like risky, like you don't die from marijuana. If you do marijuana, some people think that it's a gateway to do something like heroin, right? So kind of in that vein, I have gateway blocks. There's blocks that are very low risk to start out with if you don't have a whole lot of experience with it. And that is peripheral blocks. So an ulnar block, which I already talked about, a median nerve block and a radial nerve block for the hand. Also, one of the greatest ones, I live in Kentucky right now. I'm moving soon, but I live in Kentucky. And a lot of people walk around uh, in the country barefoot and they'll get foreign bodies, they'll get infections of the soles of their feet. And a block that I do for that is called a posterior tibial block. And it's basically one that you do at the medial ankle that completely anesthetizes the whole bottom part of the foot and low risk, low volume. 
So all that to say, the learning curve is short. It's a little steep, especially if you don't have experience doing it. It's a little bit on the steep side, but it's short if you start with peripheral blocks. And I will tell you, it's 100% worth it. When you have a patient that is hypoxic and crying because they have rib fractures, you give them a shot in their side, the serratus block, and they thank you profusely. Their oxygen saturation goes up, their pain goes away. That is so gratifying and it's better for patients. And I'll even show you here with the fascia liaca block. It's not even just a pain thing. Functionally, later on, they actually do better if you control their pain faster. The alternative, of course, is giving them a bunch of opiates until they get hypoxic or they get hypotensive and then you, you, you can't give them anymore. So there's pros and cons to each. I think about this as a, a part of multimodal pain relief. I'm not doing nerve blocks on everybody that I can do a nerve block of, but I'm doing it on everybody that I can. And I think it's going to be more beneficial than giving systemic analgesics. I'm definitely going to be doing that nerve block. Next question are you used to inject the bolus of physiologic uh, solution before the anesthetic to better visualize the top of the needle um, and the anatomic level achieve or go straight to the anesthetic? So that the there's a lot of my colleagues, uh, Arun Nagdev, who's, uh, um, I don't think I've ever told him this, but he's like legit one of my mentors. He's um, out in Highland. He's a nerve block master, him. Um, and I believe Mike Stone, who's another one of my nerve block uh, mentors, both of them, they'll have the... Um, the nerve block needle to have somebody else pushing, they'll actually start off with uh, normal saline. So they'll start off with normal saline to make sure that they're in the appropriate plane. And when they're in the appropriate plane doing what's called hydrodissection to kind of separate out the, the layers, see if they're right in the right spot. And as soon as they see that unzipping, they're in the right spot. Then they have whoever's pushing take off the normal saline and then attach the actual anesthetic to put it in that way. I think that that is a good idea. My thing is that I like to do a little bit less maneuvering, a little bit less work than I need to. And I think switching syringes is just extra steps. And when I'm doing that hydro dissection at most, I'm using like one to three cc's at most. And I really, I've not run into a situation where that one to three cc's that I used to find out if I was in the right spot. I've not run into a situation where that was what pushed me over to the maximum amount of anesthetic. So you can do it both ways. There's evidence for both and people that I highly respect do it that way. So if that makes sense to you, please do it. I just don't think that it's 100% necessary in most of the uh, cases that I am doing. Hopefully that answers uh, your question. All right, if any other questions pop up, I will definitely answer them, all right? I'll just move on with this fascia iliaca block here. All right, so again, this is you know one of the nerve blocks I had on me. Um, this is in my femoral artery. The nerve is gonna be lateral. It's this kind of triangular shaped thing. And then here is the needle coming into plane right here. Right here, right underneath this fascia iliaca. So you wanna pop into the second um, fascia layer right on top of that nerve. So right here, we're gonna get right underneath and you can see not great visualization of that needle, but you can see the anesthetic creeping underneath here. Here is a little bit of a better example. This is one that I did on a patient. Um, this was kind of like my second dose right here. So you're gonna see the needle come in, um, in plane off to that left side right there. And then you're gonna see it get into, try to get into the right spot here. Now right here, I'm actually above the fascia iliaca. I'm above it and you want to be below the fascia iliaca to get it right. Yeah, so that's not good. You don't want the injection above the fascia. And then I'm going to go a little bit further right here and get underneath this white line of the uh, fascia iliaca. So that's actually how you want to do this procedure. There are a couple of other blocks you can do. You can do something called a PENG block, P-E-N-G, and you can also do in a supra inguinal fascia iliaca block. Those both are options, and that's a whole nother like lecture topic, like the differences between all three of these, but know that there's different options. But this is one that I think is the probably the easiest to perform. I am seven minutes over. I was gonna talk a little bit more about the PENG blocks, but I have a website, it is called uh, five, uh, sorry, coralultrasound.com. I have 
all of these nerve blocks on there. So if you ever want to kind of review and refresh on how to do them, they're all there and they're free for you to see. And I'll take uh, any more questions now if we have any time. One thing I didn't really have a chance to mention because I started super late, so I didn't get a chance to put it all in there, is that when you're doing a fascia liaca block, the, the three nerves that you're trying to get into are the femoral nerve, the lateral cutaneous femoral nerve, and the obturator nerve. And with the infrainguinal fascia liaca block, you're much less likely to get the obturator than you are if you do a ping block or a supra-inguinal fascia liaca block. So, so definitely different options there. Although I will say for most intertrochanteric and femoral necks, the fascia iliaca block will dramatically decrease the amount of pain that your patient's in, even if it doesn't get rid of it all the way because you're not doing the entire hip capsule, which it's got obturator, it's got some sacral nerves, it's got some, the sciatic nerve does parts of it. Um, so it's a very complex kind of structure and it's difficult with an infrainguinal to block the whole thing, but it definitely helps. And I think that that is a good place to start with with your hip blocks. Hopefully that was helpful for you guys. Don't forget to check out courses.coreultrasound.com for all of your CME needs. It's where we put all of our courses onto so you can access them whenever you want. And if you have any questions for me, contact me at ultrasoundpodcast at gmail.com or on Twitter at coreultrasound. Hope to hear from you soon and happy scanning.